In this recording we're going to look at the legal profession itself. We're going to look at what its role is in our system of governance. And we're going to look at the process of actually entering the legal profession. I'm going to briefly discuss uh, the role of ethics and the duties that people in the legal profession have to the court and beyond. We're also going to look at other actors in terms of other organisations and bodies that impact the legal profession itself. Now there's lots of angles that we can take when we're analysing what the actual role of the legal profession is within our society. Uh, perhaps a functional way of looking at it is much as we would look at, say, engineers are. Um, engineers in a you know, quite a complex modern society fulfil a particular role because there are lots of complex things in the world, civil structures and machines these things require a great deal of technical training, knowledge and um, a group of people that really advance the particular discipline. We can also look at the legal profession as being one of advocacy. We have an adversarial system where two parties in any given legal dispute rock up to court and an impartial judge determines the outcome. As a result, there needs to be people to be able to assist parties to really interact and have a meaningful part, take meaningful part in that process. We can also think of the legal profession uh, as being a place in which judges are essentially recruited from. Now in common law systems, of course, judges form their own body, their own source by which laws and legal principles are drawn from. And in order to become a judge in the system requires a huge amount of time, and effort and, and learning. That's why judges in the common law system are traditionally quite old. Now, as well as simply learning the mechanical rules and what the law is, there's also that idea of tradition, custom, learning the appropriate norms and really involving oneself with like-minded people over that period of time. Another way of looking at the legal profession is as a component that's required as part of our democratic tradition. Lawyers and the legal profession in many ways are agitators in that we go about uh, trying to make changes to our, our systems, try and refine things. And another way of looking at that is that well, we live in a society where rights, human rights, are very important and that the legal profession as a body as a collection of people is very much geared towards trying to uphold those rights wherever possible. Another slightly more cynical um, way of looking at that is that uh, in contemporary Australian society there is a lot of role for government and there's a lot of bureaucracy, there are a lot of systems that require legal technical knowledge in order to fulfil those to a, a great extent. And so in many ways the legal profession forms a place, a source by which people can um, can really be recruited in order to fill those bodies. And incidentally that also includes the large systems of governance too. So committees, boards of governors and uh, people that work in particularly high levels in government ministries. Perhaps rather cynically, law and the legal profession can really be thought of as something in which there is only one provider or one seller of legal services. Now, in this sense, it really is a protected monopoly. The laws of the state of Queensland, and in fact across all jurisdictions, expressly forbid people who are not legal practitioners from engaging in the process of legal practice. And there's a pretty hefty penalty involved for people doing this. So at this juncture it may be helpful to sort of ask oneself, well, what's the purpose of this? Because certainly the, um, the profession would express that, well, this form of um, sanction is required in order to stop cowboys and, and people professing to have the necessary skills in order to represent others and give them structured legal advice without actually having that. And that's a, a necessary requirement to really protect the public. Now the flip side of that, I guess the more cynical way of looking at it, is that others may see that, well, 
where there is this monopoly, all that does was seek to exclude other people from entering it. By having a group of people that are essentially have um, exclusive control over the provision of legal uh, services and advice, then well, they can milk that for whatever they possibly can. And part of doing that and maintaining that monopoly is to erect barriers to prevent others from doing it. And this clearly in uh, section 24 sub 1 of the LPA is an example of such a barrier. And so you can see that these two um, chains of thought that kind of contain elements of truth in both sides. The next logical question that a potential uh, legal practitioner or a law student at this stage might ask themselves is, well, how do I get in? How do I crack this monopoly? Um, well, in order to be a practitioner, you have to hold a practicing certificate. In order to get a practice certificate, you have to be on a role, a list of practitioners in, in a particular jurisdiction. In order to reach that, you have to have been admitted to via the Supreme Court in one of those jurisdictions. In order to be admitted, uh, you have to have gone through structured education. Firstly, a, a law degree, and then secondly, uh, some sort, sort of practical legal training. And this is expressed on the slide, uh, steps that are required in order to obtain one of these practicing certificates and then practice law without falling foul of sections such as 24 of the LPA. So when looking at and thinking about the admission process, there's really two broad uh, things that need to be done. Both are required. You have to first be eligible and you have to be deemed by the admissions panel as suitable to become a registered legal practitioner. And so eligibility is the straightforward one. You have to be 18, you have to have the appropriate academic qualifications and undergraduate university degree, or, and sorry, you must also have completed the appropriate amount of legal, practical legal training. This is expressed in section 30 of the LPA. And so really you need to have a mix of each of these things. You need to have uh, a law degree, you have to have completed practical legal training, and that has to have, as a part of that training, some quantity of work experience. There is also uh, a mechanism for people that work as what's known as article clerks. Now, going back uh, a generation or two, that was the main mechanism for people to become practitioners. In more recent times, the process of working as an article clerk has, has diminished quite radically. And so the vast bulk of people seeking to become practitioners do, throw, do so by undertaking practical legal training. Now in the slide, uh, you'll see that these things, work experience, the PLT training and the, the law degree or LLB, um, gives the person who completes these things um, some knowledge, skills and certain professional values. It's also important to note here that the profession actually mandates uh, undergraduate law students to complete certain areas. There are areas of the law that are mandated for students and graduates to know in order to become practitioners. These were um, structured by Justice Priestley in uh, the early 90s. Essentially, it's a list of 11 areas of practice that all practitioners must have in order to become admitted. These include uh, contract, tort, criminal law, land and property law, the rules of evidence, um, ethics, administrative law, civil procedure, company law, equity uh, and trusts, and uh, structured knowledge of the uh, Australian constitutional law. Now in recent time, there's been calls to make some changes to the Priestley 11. Uh, it, at the moment though, it's very um, clearly structured in both the undergraduate law degree as well as in the practical legal training that all graduates must be competent in all of these areas. However, and this kind of really um, flows from the idea of the, not just the law but the legal profession itself and thus graduates needing to sort of move with the times um, and have 
specialization, people that are going and learning to go into particular practice areas earlier on in their degrees. And thus, if one, for example, was to work in, say, the tax office, it might be exceedingly rare that that person would need to, for example, have a really good structured knowledge on tort or a practitioner that might go into uh, the Department of Public Prosecutions and try to be seeking to become a Crown Prosecutor might not really need to know areas to do with contract or company law or even equity and constitutional law. And so you know, for you guys at the undergraduate level it just may be worthwhile to sort of think about the priest 11 the core mandated subjects that are you've got to do as part of your degree and to look um, at these in light of the electives that you will do for example tax or family law or secession law or intellectual property for example and think to yourself well should this be something that all lawyers should know about rather than merely those that had selected to do those as electives later in their undergraduate degrees or indeed actually learned them and started to pick up working in that area post admission. Now the other component of becoming admitted to the Supreme Court in Queensland is suitability. Basically when you apply um, you send off all of your documents and affidavits in support of your application and the board will consider your suitability. Basically you have to be uh, a fit and proper person to practice law. So what does this mean? Well basically you have to demonstrate that you don't have a track record of doing things that would undermine the legal profession as a whole. In other words whether you have a history of uh, say criminal offences, um, systemic difficulties in following regulations and including things such as parking fines, speed camera tickets, um, they check to see whether or not you have any uh, issues with government departments such as Centrelink uh, or the tax office, they also uh, ask questions uh, about yeah about your your criminal history and any difficulties that, that you've had with in the criminal justice system. Now as well as uh, I guess these sorts of structural things being a fit and proper person extends um, to, to a lot of things more broadly than that. For example academic misconduct. Now in earlier recordings I spoke briefly uh, about uh, a student at this institution at James Cook University who applied to become a solicitor and was refused. Essentially what had happened is that there was allegations of academic misconduct and that the student had plagiarized some assignments and yeah when it came up it actually went to the Court of Appeal and they said um, they said no. Now that's not no you can never become a practitioner what they said is that look at this point in time you haven't demonstrated that you're a fit and proper person and so that application to become a practitioner was refused. Now this is a really important consideration for students currently going through um, the undergraduate degree because your conduct and your candor and how you go about doing things in both your um, academic but also your personal and professional lives is of paramount importance essentially as part of the suitability process you are obliged to put all your cards on the table in order to go through this process for the board to actually determine whether or not you really ought to be registered as a legal practitioner and be let into this um, to the legal profession this great protected monopoly. Now assuming that you are deemed at that time to be fit and proper uh, then you have to attend a ceremony and in front of the uh, Supreme Court judge and sign, uh, swear an oath. You actually go and affirm that you will, when you're engaged in the practice, um, engaged as a legal practitioner, will do so honestly and according to the laws of the land. And it's at that point that your duty, your paramount duty to the court uh, commences. 
That is not to say, however, that things end at that point. Once a person has been admitted to become a practitioner, there are, well, there's one very important additional step, and that's to actually obtain a practicing certificate. In order to do this, you have to, um, and to maintain this practicing certificate, you have to do what's called continuous professional development. Now there's a little bit of complexity the first time one is issued a practicing certificate because you know, in theory once you've finished your PLT training and your degree you should already at that point in time have uh, reached I guess the pinnacle of your structured education but it's a really important um, aspect of being a legal practitioner is to continuously learn and as such to maintain your practicing certificate each year uh, practitioners, and this varies by the, the area, uh, they have to do a certain number of hours to really keep the skill set up, to keep involved in the profession, and also to maintain a, uh, a level of uh, integrity as well. And so ethics and uh, trust accounting are compulsory modules in order to maintain um, your certificate through the CPD system. Now, um, it's also imperative to maintain your certificate and to really to stay on the role of practitioners is to still be of a fit and proper person to practice law. In other words, that you still have to be of good character when you are out in the world. And from time to time, um, practitioners become unstuck where their personal lives can actually lead to them to become or be brought before the board and, and actually end up being struck off, often with things, particularly heinous things, involving dishonesty. I had a professor when I studied legal philosophy many years ago and, and he said when legal ethics started to be taught as a discipline in, in the university, that fundamentally it was really the profession trying to encourage students to, to and this is a little tongue in cheek, don't steal their clients' money. And so there's a very straightforward way of getting struck off, and that's to misuse and abuse trust account money. There are very, very strict rules about how money that's held on trust on behalf of clients is to be managed, how it's to be recorded and accounted for, and how it's to be dispensed. And in going through and reading decisions by the board, and things that often go to the tribunal and sometimes go to the appeal uh, appellate courts, Misuse of client trust money is the single most common method for practitioners to be removed from the role. Now, there's another, I, I guess, slightly more upbeat feature of becoming admitted, and that's uh, the mutual recognition charter. Basically, there are laws in each of the jurisdictions in Australia and in the United Kingdom and in New Zealand that allows people uh, who are admitted to a, um, in a particular jurisdiction here to practice elsewhere. Sometimes there is some aspect of retraining that's required. In other words, you may have to un undertake certain uh, local or region specific education in order to obtain a practicing certificate in that jurisdiction, but otherwise you're free to travel um, and ply your trade in jurisdictions with very similar legal frameworks. So when thinking about practitioners, that is those holding uh, a current practitioner certificate, there's, they really can be divided into two types. Solicitors, who form the vast bulk of um, lawyers and barristers. Collectively, these uh, people are known as lawyers. We don't use the term attorneys in Australia at all. That's really a North American thing. So solicitors are really form the, the very much the large bulk of people who engage in legal practice. They come in a wide variety of, of forms and have a wide variety of skills. Some people practice uh, law in a very broad sense as general sort of practitioners that can work particularly in smaller firms where they're exposed to lots of different areas of law and uh, can be asked questions and are allowed to give advice on all of those areas. However, it's far more common for people both within firms and within things like government departments and um, larger bodies, companies and other statutory bodies such as councils and universities for people to have areas that they specialise in. 
Now this can be uh, informal, in other words, um, say you've got a law firm of 10 people, some people may just prefer to do certain types of work, for example strata title or issues involving uh, say the tort of defamation, for example. Now these are um, usually internal delineations in terms of where work gets divided. However, there are also s actual structured specialisations. Now, in order to advertise as being um, a specialist in a certain area, then you actually have to be registered with um, the relevant institution or organisation in the jurisdiction that you're practising. For example, in Queensland, to actually say on your business card or your advertisement that you are a registered criminal law specialist, you have to have completed, completed a certain course and maintained that certificate with uh, usually a higher um, amount of specific uh, CPD, uh, continuous professional development points uh, in courses. Uh, one distinction that solicitors engaged in private practice have is, is the ability to, uh, to choose clients. Uh, because there's, um, there's money passing hands, when uh, an individual comes to seek legal advice from a particular, a particular firm, there's uh, a very structured process um, for actually obtaining that advice. You have to fill in a, a series of forms and usually early on in that process one pays, uh, puts a payment, puts some money into a trust account. Now, nine times out of ten or nine nine times out of a hundred, um, law firms you know, want business and they won't will willingly turn people away that they can give structured advice to. However, from time to time it, it's maybe necessary for it to refer a particular person on to a more uh, appropriate either a private firm or to um, the various not-for-profits and pro bono organisations. This differs, by the way, from barristers. Barristers are actually subject to, to a, uh, an interesting rule called the cab rank rule, where in theory um, a barrister who uh, has delivered a brief must take that brief. Barristers are also interesting in that they don't actually advertise directly uh, for work. Work usually flows through to barristers uh, after a person's contact a particular law firm and and uh, I guess a more experienced advocate is required either to give structured um, advice in the form of a legal opinion and or um, a, a person's required to go to court. That's not to say that solicitors can't go to court but barristers specialise in this area. As a result, um, to become a barrister, usually a person has worked as a solicitor for uh, sometimes a very, very long time. People go, they, they use the phrase, I get called to the bar, uh, often later in their legal careers. And most judges, judges and magistrates, are picked from the bar, which is the collective name to describe all of the barristers within a particular jurisdiction. So at this juncture, I think it may be helpful to just have something of a discussion on career paths. Again, most people listening to this recording will be in the process of undertaking an undergraduate degree early on in the process. And so I think a few, I guess, real truths need to be put on the table at this point. The first is that the law and the legal profession is largely structured um, particularly for the uh, the early steps for people to be employees. In other words, in order to, um, uh, after one obtains a practice certificate, the idea is that as a graduate one enters the entry level of law firms and works for other people for uh, uh, between two and three years. After this time, a person, assuming they've had an appropriate amount of tutelage and have done the appropriate um, additional uh, courses that are required, and that varies by jurisdiction, then uh, the person can apply for an open certificate. That means that that uh, person can now be a partner, in other words, doesn't require a high level supervision within the firm, or can go out on their own and create their own law firm. Now, it's also important to note that in terms of government policy, it's a really, really strong push, Australia-wide, both in state and federal level, uh, for a higher percentage of people in society to have undergraduate degrees. So as a result, there are many, many more people who are undertaking law, uh, either both as a primary um, source of study or as part of a, a joint degree or even a graduate degree after doing another uh, area. 
So what that means for people going through the uh, degree at, at this stage is it's really it's really a simple exercise in supply and demand. There are many, many more graduates than there are firms who need graduates. In fact, it's one thing, I guess one of those cold hard truths when uh, people are going and looking and applying for roles outside of university, Certainly, it's encouraged for people to look at job advertisements while going through the undergraduate process. And in most situations for legal jobs, you'll see the phrase, a certain number of years, PAE, that's post-admission experience. And largely, this is just simply a result of supply and demand. There are many people on the market. As a result, employers can demand that uh, potential employees have obtained experience elsewhere before um, moving into even entry-level paid work. Now this isn't uh, actually a law specific uh, problem. Uh, other professions, uh, professional disciplines, architecture, engineering um, and so on, uh, are going through this process of again lots of people being qualified for relatively few paid roles. And that's not to say that there aren't uh, roles to, that uh, graduates can move uh, into straight uh, after finishing uh, that process. Um, However, to sort of, I guess in some ways, sort of fill this gap, there are many community legal organisations uh, who offer sort of volunteer positions. Also, these organisations uh, take volunteers from the profession itself. People feel as part of, I guess, sort of giving back to the community and having the sense of civic engagement, um, they undertake volunteer, unpaid volunteer work through these providers. So examples here is the um, TCLS, the Townsville Community Legal Services, uh, QPilch, the Queensland Public Interest Law Clearinghouse, and there are some very special needs organisations. The Independent Advocate for People with Disabilities, uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Legal Service, um, there are certain women's legal services that are uh, available, and, and each of those will take uh, interns, uh, usually on an unpaid basis. Now, as I've already discussed, uh, the bar, becoming a barrister, is another career path, uh, certainly a legitimate career path that a, um, a person, when looking at a career in the law, may seek to head down. And, and also note that most judicial uh, appointments are made from those who are in the bar. So it's not an uncommon thing for a person, after working as a solicitor, sometimes for a very long time, to then, I guess, go off on their own to become a barrister. But just just note though, in terms of business models, when a person has, uh, or as a partner in a law firm for example, and you have staff, you have um, employees who do the vast bulk of the work, as a business model this means that you can sort of, you're sort of taking the, essentially the fruits of their labour, and that's capitalism. However, when working as a barrister, you only have yourself. You can only essentially keep the fruits of your own labour and your own time, which is uh, unfortunately very finite. The last thing that I want to discuss that's on the slide here with a question mark is entrepreneurship. You see, because the legal profession is, as I've described earlier, protected monopoly, it's difficult to actually go about creating novel goods and services that flow from legal practice itself. Now I've left this as something of an open-ended question here because the, the, the law is changing, the world is changing and so it, it really should be helpful to think about at this stage in one's career in the early in the undergraduate level to really think about novel, interesting, innovative ideas that you might have at, even at this stage that you might be able to bring and and fruition somehow and integrate that with uh, a career in the law. Uh, for example, um, integrating artificial intelligence into the production of legal advice or having intelligent design ideas for document management in law firms, just as some examples. Maybe really helpful to think about things and also think about really the the structural difficulties there are in, in really having this level of entrepreneurship where you've got a discipline and profession that's very much structured to be a formal hierarchy. 
I've talked about ethics and legal ethics in particular in several of the earlier recordings and I just want to reiterate that a person who is admitted to legal practice is bound by these rules. And these go uh, above and beyond um, merely a philosophical concept of ethics. They are very structured rules that practitioners are bound by that are enshrined um, both in the unwritten law and the common law as well as flowing from the Legal Profession Act. There are certain rules of conduct that practitioners must follow. Now these govern such things as conflict between clients, they govern how information is to be passed between client and, and firm and firm and other firms, they govern how one deals with former clients in terms of that information. And they also enshrine the various duties that a person, uh, that a legal practitioner has. And it may be very helpful to remember that fundamentally when a person enters the legal profession and you're engaging as a practitioner, your number one duty, your paramount duty is to the court itself. It's to the administration of justice that the practitioner must bow down to. And I think it's a really useful thing to, to really um, explore and think about in your own life in terms of what it is that you seek to achieve by entering into the legal profession. Because largely, but not entirely, people are driven by self-interest. Hey, I want to be a lawyer because I, for example, want a very prestigious career, I want regular income, or I want lots of income. Now, all of these sort of goals and desires really have to be looked at through this lens, this idea that when you become a practitioner, you, you sure, yes, there is often extrinsic rewards um, that flow from that, but fundamentally it's about your own interests being subject to this paramount duty. So it's helpful to think about our system, our capitalist um, society, and the notion of self-interest, that is we go into the world and we earn money and we do it for ourselves, how that's kind of sitting really uncomfortably with the idea that a legal practitioner owes their number one, their paramount duty to the court and the administration of justice itself. It's something that a person early in their career should really think very carefully about. I'm just going to talk briefly about lawyers in popular culture. Now some of the examples you'll see on the slide there are, um, are American. Nonetheless, it's a very helpful thing to appreciate the view that the rest of society has on lawyers and the legal profession itself. Now there have been quite a few studies that have uh, been conducted, surveys that have been run, where the public is asked uh, to sort of rank professions and unfortunately the legal profession ranks quite low in terms of the public's uh, view of it. And even more unsettlingly, it's not uh, at all uncommon for similar things to be conducted inside industries and people inside the legal profession often rank it as worse than the general public do. In terms of such, um, such words as integrity, trustworthiness and, and, uh, and honesty. And I think it's helpful though, again just to looking at the slide and the uh, 10 or so lawyers that are on there, to sort of look at them in terms and think about their personality, in terms of their personal attributes and what makes them good or bad as a person and what makes them good and bad as a legal practitioner. And I think a very important aspect of this is this concept of winning, the need to win cases, the need to beat the opposition, particularly in our adversarial system, is you know, unfortunately a feature that we ascribe to, in inverted commas, good, great, the best lawyers. And that can be troubling in onto itself because the process to go about winning and beating and competing and demolishing your opposition often don't sit comfortably with our notions of what good human beings are and, as discussed earlier, doesn't also sit very comfortably with the solicitor's paramount duty being to the court. 
Another theme that I, you may draw from this is charisma. Part of the lawyer's job, and this applies to both solicitors and barristers, is p to persuade people, to persuade the court, or in particular the judge, to agree with your side of, uh, of a legal argument that's placed before her or him, to persuade the other side in a dispute to settle, or, and often in fact, to persuade your client of a particular course of action to take, to either go to court or not go to court, as the case may be. And so this persuasion aspect and this uh, inherent need to be charismatic sometimes is also uh, tied up with appearances. And so we make this connection uh, to people that we find appealing. Now, in the case of uh, the lawyers in popular culture, and clearly these are these are actors in this case, but if we turn to the next slide, which is Solicitor's famous lawyers in real life, you'll see you know, something of a similar trend that continues. Part of being a good lawyer is being persuasive, and that flows you know, a lot from your personality and how you go about expressing yourself. And again, I encourage people, even this early in your undergraduate careers, to really think about how you present yourself, how you go about speaking, how you go about communicating, and not just with um, sort of formal structures. Also, um, in other words, dealing at this stage perhaps with, uh, say, members of academic staff, but also people in that you deal with in, say, government or in organisations. Um, how you deal with those who are your peers, for example, those th that you know, currently are your classmates, but may very well follow you into the legal profession that you may be working with, either side by side or across the bar table. The final thing I wish to discuss are other actors in the legal profession. Now the first of these is the Queensland Law Society, QLS. Now clearly this, the name of these organisations vary across jurisdiction, but fundamentally it's an association of legal practitioners. In order to become a full member of QLS you have to be a legal practitioner and they coordinate and organise uh, all of the continuous professional development that is required in order to, for a person to maintain a practising certificate under the Legal Profession Act. Uh, another actor in our system of governance are royal commissions. Now you may from time to time have heard, uh, particularly in the political sphere, the mentioning of establishing royal commissions to investigate particular problems in our society. The important thing to note about royal commissions is that they are chaired or headed by usually retired members of the judiciary and they are given powers, they're given the powers of court in order to actually call people to the commission and make them give evidence. A person who refuses to do this can be held in contempt. Now, essentially the role is it's all, it's inquisitorial in that uh, the commissioner leads a body that goes about investigating a certain matter and usually hands a report back to Parliament as a result. Similarly, law reform commissions are usually a body that's established in order to investigate a particular area of law in order to determine whether or not there are some form of defects, and if there are, to identify ways in which these can be resolved. These commissions will usually take submissions, both from the public and also from members of the profession, and these are considered in depth and detail in order to try and work out how the law can be made better. In earlier recordings, I've discussed and analysed the role of the Attorney General. That is a political position, it's a ministry, the head of the Department of Justice, and the Attorney General's role is to administer the courts and the court system, and to make decisions about how prosecutions are to be run, and from time to time to determine whether or not matters that have failed, whether um, the prosecutors have failed, or when a particular concerned citizen in society wishes to bring an action, um, there are many statutes in which the Attorney General must give assent before that matter can continue. Now, the DPP, the Department 
of public prosecutions is the body that prosecutes people for indictable offences. These are offences in Queensland that are in the district or the Supreme Courts you know, that are of significant seriousness. They also handle appeals that people make under Section 222 of the Justices Act. And they bring about appeals where a particular person is found uh, usually not guilty by a court, a lower court, and um, the matter needs to go uh, to go further up. And they also oppose appeals by um, people that are found guilty that wish for the matters uh, on questions of law to be reviewed by high court. Now, the Solicitor General is an interesting role. It's the Originally, the Solicitor General was very much seen as sort of this, the second in command, the second law officer to the Attorney General. In more recent times, though, it's been essentially um, made independent and operates as a, um, a fully sort of commercial and competitive law firm. The idea is that the Solicitor General provides advice for the government itself. Um, particularly on in the federal sense, on matters of constitutional significance and international law, and in cases where the government has a particular interest. Finally, the media. Now, the media holds a very special, very important, and very unusual place in our system of governance, in that the media really provides the mechanism in which citizens become informed of themselves in terms of political and legal happenings. As a result, arguably, the media is a very powerful player in that matters that have appeared before uh, the courts can actually be framed in a certain light in order to make certain parties appear to be more or less uh, malevolent. And also that the process itself can be cast in a certain light, depending on how things are, are phrased and structured. The media also has the option, because in um, Australia, the, most of the media is not state-owned. Private organisations have the option to go and pick and choose which matters they wish to report back to the public. And it, it's really helpful to remember, it's almost like this is coming in full circle, because as we discussed in earlier recordings, the underlying legitimacy of our system of governance, of the state, of sovereignty, flows from the people. And as the slide shows, again a little tongue in cheek, that the media to some extent controls, can heavily influence public opinion. And so it really ought to be thought of as an important part in this process and its role in our system to really be kept um, in the back of our minds.